jump into it um, today. So uh, let's open our Bibles once again to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Um, man, what a blessing it is to live in this country um, where we can freely worship God. Amen. As I was sharing earlier today, um, having that chance to speak with those missionaries last, last week, last Sunday evening, um, we had them come by the house. They were just in town. They happened to be in town while we were out of town, and so they were going out of town again, and um, we, we knew some of the same people, um, were in some of the same circles, and so just was able to uh, connect with them, um, and, and man, it was just really a blessing to me. Um, to do that. I mean, we already support a missionary in China and, well, actually more than one missionary in China. Um, and uh, we, we help with, with missions in China. But um, just again, to hear that and, and to, um, to hear what they're doing and just how, um, how they're meeting and how they're impacting lives there in China. Again, they have to smuggle Bibles in because the government tries to control that and tries to limit what... Um, the people of that country is able to receive. But again, Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Amen. So this gospel must be preached and must get into all the world. I mean, I don't know about you, but I thank God that Jesus is coming back. But this gospel must be preached to all the ends of the world first. And so there are people out there that still never heard about Jesus. Believe it or not, there are people in America that never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I went to college one time with one guy. He said, no, nobody ever told me. Isn't that crazy? Um, so um, thank God again that we can come together. We don't have to be concerned about whether, you know, they're going to try to lock us up for attending church or whatever. So let's go again to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we've been on this series um, for since the beginning of the year called Seek First. And I keep wanting to go on to something else. Um, even up until this morning, I'm like not necessarily pleading with the Lord, but I'm still checking. Lord, can I, can I go on to this other thing? And he's like, no, just go back to this. How many of y'all been enjoying it? All right. If it was just one person that God was having me do that for, it would be worth it. And, um, and I thank God because I have been, and thank you all for sharing those testimonies because it really encourages me. Encourages me. Many of you have been saying, man, this, this, this series on Seek First and even the one on Reigning as Kings has really changed and impacted my life. And again, I've, I've been getting testimonies back. Um, one of the people in my connect group, um, my Kingdom Business Connect group shared with me that um, he said, you know, that series on Reign as Kings, he said it really changed the way that I thought and, and things that I did. And so um, he's in real estate development um, and investing. And, um, and he said, the Lord said to me, he said, why don't you start investing in, in Kingdom Business? Or this, no, this is what he said. He said, why don't you start doing some kingdom investing? And so he shared this testimony just this past, um, this Friday in our connect group. And he said, so I, he said, so that's what I started doing. He said, I started, we started being more purposeful with our giving and, and increasing our giving. And, and he said, um, and then they shared with me because um, he's doing some things on his own, but he also works for a company where that company, the, the owner is actually a Christian. And the owner, when he hired him, now, if you know his background, not the owner's background, but this guy's background, if you know his background, when him and his wife first got married, he was laid off and without a job for two years. So sometimes you hear the testimonies about people and you don't know what it is that they went through and you think like, oh, you know, but I'm in my stuff, uh, you know, but he, he lived that type of life. And so, of course, there's this mentality that can kind of make you worried about um, life. And about stuff. And again, we've been talking about this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. Um, it says, uh, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, right? But your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. Jesus was saying, don't worry about the stuff. Don't worry about what you'll wear, what you'll eat, what you'll do, all this different stuff, right? The Gentiles, those that are without God, they're constantly caught up in the rat race trying to do and attain these different things. But he says, but seek first. Seek what? So not after everything, not, you know, not trying to fit God into our time, not trying to fit and, and budget God into our budget, you know, after everything else is taken care of, right? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be, what? Added to you. And so God told him, 
um, he said, why don't you start doing some kingdom investing? And so this owner, um, you know, when he got hired, the owner said to him, he said, hey, he said, I'm a, basically he said, he said, the Lord told me this, that you're going to make me millions. And it's already happened. He's been working there for six years now. It's already happened. But they shared with me, like, when we start to do this, you know, there's other people on the job that is just kind of jealous and trying to say, we got to work out, re restructure this whole organization because it ain't fair that he seems like he's getting all the business and getting all the, um, the, the bonuses. It was to the point where he started giving away stuff. Like I said, here's this project that's going to work because whatever he puts his hands to is multiplying and being blessed. Isn't that amazing? And so, um, and so he was saying that already I have five different projects. He said, uh, for instance, one, one project, um, you know, we might buy, it's, it's big money, okay? We might, we might buy something for like, the, the project might cost about $24 million to do. And we want to double our money, so $48 million. He said, so we bought, we'll buy this land and then we'll put up this, this structure, um, you know, it's like luxury apartments and these different stuff. And so he said, we would do that. He said, and the project isn't even finished yet. He said, all we have is the slab and some, and some two by fours up and already it's being sold. So we, that one that was going to cost us $24 million, which we didn't even spend all the money yet, um, already it was sold for $48 million. Are you all hearing me? And, and the thing is, this is, he said, these are five different projects already for the year that is already sold without having to complete it. And it's like where things are coming in that he's like saying, okay, here, why don't you take this project? And it's strange because it's like you're giving up your bonus. But it's because there's some things that God has placed in his heart to do because they want to help finance the kingdom. I, I, I hold back sometimes from sharing certain things and certain numbers because sometimes our small thinking can limit God because we think we're not in the right environment. We think we're not, we weren't raised the right way. We think that our parents jacked us up. And, and we, we think that, well, I've made so many different mistakes already. We think, we think that I, I don't live in the right place. But let me tell you something, God can take you from right where you are and use you. If, if you're just willing to say, Lord, I'm a vessel that you can use. And as we were talking about going through the money test. And like I said earlier, please understand, when we teach along these lines, my intention is never about trying to get you to give more. I know, some of you are like, well, Pastor, I know that. Yeah, but sometimes we have new people. Sometimes we have people who could, could listen to other people who have problems. And like, you know, you got friends on Facebook that, oh, the church just doing this. Can I, can I give you some stats real quick? Let me give you some stats as a matter of fact. Um, in America, in America, let me give you these stats, okay? Well, let me just give you stats about a Christians, okay? Christians. Uh, okay, out of churches that accept tithing online, um, you know, of course, there's an increase. But out of those that give online, only 5% tithe. And 80% of Americans only give 2% of their income. Christians, this is, this is I, I didn't come up with this stuff. This is research, okay. Christians are giving at 2.5% of income. Whereas during the Great Depression, it was at 3.3%. During the Great Depression, okay? Um, only 3 to 5% of Americans who give to their local church do so through regular tithing. When surveyed, 17% of Christians state that they regularly tithe. They state so. They say that they do, but anyways. And then listen, for families making 75000 plus... Only 1% of them gave at least 10% in tithing. 
Um, the average giving by adults who attend U.S. Protestant churches is about $17 a week. 37% of regular church attendees and evangelicals don't give money to church. 37%, right? These are those that will just give nothing. Um, 17% of American families have reduced the amount that they give to their local church. 7% of churchgoers have dropped their regular giving by 20% or more. Mm-hmm. 77% of those who tithe give 11 to 20% or more of their income, far more than the baseline of 10%. So um, let's, let's go to Philippians chapter 4 real quick. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And I want to share with you, uh, today I want to talk about um, your kingdom account. Your kingdom account. With the time that I do have remaining, I want to talk about this. Philippians chapter 4. And, and again, for me, years ago, I never wanted to talk about these things because um, even though I practice tithing and giving, from an early age. And, I, and, and every year, you know, when I started to learn some more stuff and get some revelation, I started to increase my giving more. And I loved what it did in my life. But as a pastor, I never wanted to be labeled as one of those that was, you know, oh, there they go, preacher. You know, they're just trying to fatten their wallets and all these different stuff. I mean, let's be honest. We, we've all encountered um, cases like that. Or, or some of us may have had to break that mindset when it comes to, uh, to that. Well... Um, but the Lord dealt with me strongly, and, 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 you know, he understood my heart. The reason why I didn't want to do it is because there has been some excess. There has been, um, there has been some abuse in churches. Some of you may have came out of some of those different things. I mean, you know, there they have been um, all kinds of different stuff. I mean, they would, there's churches that would put your names up on a list, the non-tithers board. And I don't know how people dealt with that. Like, why would you go to a church like that? Can I just say this to make everybody free? To come to this church, you don't have to give a dime. There are some of you that don't. Now, let me say this. It's amazing that our church, we do, you know, these numbers don't necessarily completely apply to our church. I'm not telling you everybody is tithing and giving, but we have a large amount that are. Right? And so thank you so much because without what you're doing, we would not be able to make the impact that we're making. You know, I mean, well, God will bring it from some other way, but I'm saying, but you get to be a part of what's happening. We would not be able to make the impact that we're making. We would not be able to help the gospel go out into some of these countries where you're not willing to go to or where you can't get to, right? And lives are being touched every single week. Why? Because we're seeking first the kingdom of God. We want to see his kingdom expand. As a matter of fact, um, your number one purpose for giving should not be just to get. And, and sometimes I think that, you know, because of how things are, well, it's not even about how things are taught. It's sometimes just what we want to hear. Have you, as a parent, have you ever said something to your children and they just heard what they want to hear? You all know as a pastor that happens to me as well too. It's like, some, oh, pastor, you said, I said that? And that's what you got out of that? And so because... Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because of that, when we, whenever we talk about it, because your money is connected to your heart. And so when we hear about the blessings, we so run to that. And it's like we feel that we could treat God like some kind of sugar daddy or some kind of um, slot machine and, and all that. And yes, please, we don't apologize for teaching on the blessing. There is a blessing tied to it, but first and foremost, your number one motive for giving should be because I love God. And because I want to see, I love God, I love my church, I want to see the kingdom of God continue to advance and expand. People who don't give, they really come from a selfish mindset. It's just about how can I get ahead, how can I, and again, Jesus was saying, hey, listen, don't be like the Gentiles. They, where they're just thinking about their stuff. Well, I, I got this too. I got I to gotta eat. I got to drink, don't I? 
I got my, my kids need some clothes. Well, Jesus said, your father knows that you have need of all these different things. He knows you got your mortgage to pay. He knows that you got your, um, all the different stuff that you decided to add on to your life to make it more expensive for you and, and all that. And so you're struggling to just hold your head above water. He, he, knows, he knows how much you need that cable. He knows how much you need. Amen. But we got to shift things. And make sure that we're seeing things the way that he wants us to see it. And so here in Philippians chapter 4, Paul here writing. Let's read from verse 10. In verse 10, and I'm reading from the New King James. He said, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at your last care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Somebody say Opportunity. Um, it says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, let me say this real quick. Um, this is a place that we need to be. You need to learn to be content wherever you are. Content does not mean that you don't press. Content just means that Wherever I am, I've learned to find joy in that season. In other words, because some people will say things like, oh, when, you know, um, when I get married, then I'll be content. When I, when I have children, then I'll be content. When, when I get rid of these kids, then I'll be content, right? <laughs> or when, I, when, I, um, when we start making more money, then I'll be, no, no, no. Paul said, listen, this is something that I've had to learn, that I'm learning how to do. I'm learning how to be content with where I am. Um, I learned how to abound. I learned how to be. Uh, I learned how to be prosperous, right? And so um, we have to learn to be content. But it doesn't mean that we don't keep pressing, because God is a God that expects us to increase. Somebody touch your neighbor if you can. Reach out to them and say, God wants you to increase. God wants you to increase. Touch your neighbor on the other side and say, God wants you to increase. You must know that for yourself. You, you must have this solidified in your heart that God wants me to increase. Not only does he want you to increase, but he expects you to increase. Well, how do you know? Just ask the talent. Ask, ask the, the guys with the talents. The one that had the five and the one that had the two brought back and it increased what the master had given to him. And, and the master was so happy. He said, well done. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you more. Because you've been faithful in what I entrusted to you. And the one with the one did nothing and just gave back. He didn't even lose a talent. It would be one thing. We think that sometimes it's like, well, you know, well, Lord, I mean, my bad. I lost a talent. He said, no, you, the fact that you just gave me back, the same thing that I gave you, you did not increase. You knew that I expected a harvest even in places where I didn't sow. You wicked and lazy servant. He was not happy right now. He didn't even get like, you know, real politically correct with it and say, well, well, there you go. I mean, listen, I know your heart. I, I appreciate your heart in this. That you didn't, you know, I, I can understand you were, you were concerned for, for what I entrusted to you. No, he's like, no, come on. You should have done something with what I gave you. And there's been so much deposited on the ins. If you've been coming to this church for some kind of time, listen, if you're not producing, shame on you. You know, you know why I say that? I mean, without, you know, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Please, you know, so I, please, I'm not trying to preach shame. But I'm saying that I have been depositing. I have been placing things. I have been speaking things. I have, from God, words from heaven for this generation. And if we're not doing something with it, guess what? It ain't your pastor's fault. As much as I want to take responsibility, and I do, but then I've come to realize, and I feel free because, Lord, no, I've been saying this thing. And no matter how much you say it, some people will not move and will not do anything and will sit on their talent. And you'll be praying, oh, you know, shabba do all those different things. 
God, why don't you see me? Lord, I've been going around the, the walls of Jericho. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, thank God for all those different things. But, man, just do it. Do the word. So Paul was saying this. I learned to be a base and I learned how to abound. Let's skip down to verse 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I know we love quoting this verse. Oh, Christian people love quoting this verse. But in its context, it's talking about giving and receiving. In its context. Now, we can use this verse for other areas. How many love this verse? People say, oh, this is my favorite verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I just don't like the context that it's in. Because we'll say things like, oh, we could do all things through Christ who strengthens me when you're talking about, oh, I can, uh, you know, I can cook this meal or I can do this. But uh, when it comes to giving, no, I can't. I, I can't. I can't afford to do it. I can't. It's amazing how we can have our good confessions for these other errors. But in this context, uh, I can't. I can't do this. I'm barely making it. How can I do this? I can't. I can't. But Paul says... But I can do all things through Christ. I've learned to be a base. I've learned to abound. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Paul is talking about giving here. He said, now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving. It wasn't just about giving. Right? Some of you are good givers, but the reason why I teach is not about you giving, but it's about your giving and your receiving. No church shared with me concerning giving and receiving only. I mean, but you only. As a matter of fact, uh, one translation says no church opened up a debit and credit account. Is it possible that we have a heavenly account, a kingdom account? So he says, for you sent... Even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again, verse 16. Um, even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. And then he says this, he says, look at this, not that I seek the gift, but the fruit that abounds to your account. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. In other words, sometimes, every, you know, a lot of times preachers, when we teach on this, you, you know, even Paul is like, hey, just in case anybody's suspicious, it's not that I seek the gift. But what I am seeking is the fruit that abounds to your account. You hear what I'm saying? So that's why, again, I, I mean, I, I'm free. Really, ask anybody. Nobody is ever, like, you know, excommunicated from the church because they don't give or they don't tithe or whatever the case is. You can freely come and suck up all our AC and, you know, and nobody's going to complain and say, <laughs> you know, this is the tither's row. This is, this is those that sow and above section. We don't even have it classified by section. There's no reserved seating or anything like that, you know, um, type of thing. I mean, there may be a few seats reserved for, like, ushers or, uh, you know, particular things. But, but you're, you know, based upon your giving, nobody is treated, treated better or, or whatever because of how much you give. Because tell you what, we're not for sale and I ain't even for rent. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody, I, I tell you what, nobody, I don't care who rich person come in here and try, because this stuff happens in churches. They, oh, well, I'm going to leave if you don't do this, this way, and all this different things. Well, there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. Because I have to answer to God. We appreciate you, but listen, this is his ministry anyways. If he couldn't take care of it, if it was all dependent upon you to begin with, then he might as well let this whole ship sink. So Paul was saying, not that I seek the gift, but what I do seek is the fruit that abounds to your account. You know, even as I was sharing Tyle's testimony this morning about, you know, <laughs> what I say? Kyle's testimony. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. As I was sharing Kyle's testimony this morning, um, you know, and even when he, he shared with me because he sent me a text message last week, he said, he said, Pastor, he said, he said, I got a praise report, and he told me about, um, this and not only that, but then also having a seller, which is something that he wanted, and and all that. You know what I did? I rejoiced, not because I'm thinking about, oh, he's gonna give another thirty percent. <laughs> it really wasn't. But you know what it did to my heart? Like my gosh, look at the fruit that's abounding to his account. 
Look at what's happening. Look at what's happening in his family and all that. And he, and he said, I got a seller. And then he said, I got something else in the works for another, can I say it? Hmm. For another 2.6 million. You understand what I'm saying? And this is not to single out some, just one particular person. What I'm saying is because it's not just about the giving. Notice what he did was he had to go back and listen to those messages. Well, why, why was he doing that? Because he needed to build himself up in faith. Because if you're doing it outside of faith, it's not necessarily pleasing God anyways. That's why we never want you to give out of fear. We don't preach fear when it comes to tithing. We don't preach fear when it comes to, to someone like, if you don't give, this is going to happen. No, but Paul was saying that there's an account. We all have a kingdom account. And it's not just about the finances. I mean, if you look over in Acts, we see the story of Cornelius. How the Bible says his giving and his prayers came up as a memorial before God. And he was commended that God sent an angel to, to Cornelius to talk to him and to tell him, send people for Peter. Send, send men to Joppa to get Peter because he's going to come and he's going to preach the gospel to you. In other words, things took place for him that money could never do for him. He got saved. His whole family got saved and filled with the spirit of God. Those are things you can't put a money value on it. Our number one motive should be because we love God. We want, his, we want to see his kingdom increase. That should be our number one motive. You have an heaven, a, a, a heavenly account. Are you all hearing what I'm saying today? I hope I'm making sense. So Paul was saying that, listen... Um, because the stuff that's going on now is not anything that just, just all of a sudden happened. But Paul was saying, no other church. See, I think sometimes we think everybody's giving. But, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul was saying, not a single. So, so Paul was an apostle. He, he started up churches and, and all that. And these other churches were not, um, these are churches that he started. They were not giving to him to help in the work of you know, these other churches. So what Paul would do is he ended up going and getting a job. And I know people say things like, well, I don't see pastors go ahead and get jobs and all that stuff. I sometimes wish that we could put some people in our work schedules and let them say, okay, go ahead and try. Because people will say things like, you know, oh, these pastors don't do nothing. Why, I mean, why do these churches need computers anyway? I remember when we started church, somebody was like, why your church need a computer anyways? Somebody came in and was like, You're, you work in the office? I mean, what, what do you do? Paul said, no church share with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. In other words, there were other churches that weren't contributing to that. That's why this church, I'm so thankful. It's one of our core values that we will lead the way in generosity. We, we will. We are leading the way in generosity. That's why we have such a heart to give towards missions. And when we started increasing our giving in this area and in missions, then God supernaturally started doing things in this church. Amen. To where, <clears throat> excuse me, already for the year, already for the year, we've given over $50,000 towards world missions. And here it is. We're at the beginning of the year. A church this size. And there are larger churches that are doing more. Thank God for that. But there are larger churches that ain't doing that much. Are, are y'all hearing me? Where at one point, if we got 50,000 in a year, yep. oh, Lord, we can make it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <there's God. laughs> Lord, you, you have, you've, you've placed your approval upon us. Thank you, Lord. It's so true. But now we're giving. And here's the thing, people are rejoicing in other countries because of your giving. So you said, no one shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. He said, indeed, I have all and I, um, and I am full 
having received from Epaphroditus, the things sent to you, a sweet smell and aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. In verse 19, he says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And now a lot of believers love this verse and want to apply it to their life, but this does not apply to everybody. So while you're at the gas station talking about, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, this does not work if it's detached from the other verses ahead. Are y'all hearing me? So while, listen, we preach faith, we love faith, I don't apologize for preaching faith, but you could be talking faith all you want and claiming this verse all you want. They, Paul didn't even say, you know, he said, my God shall supply all your needs. He made that statement. And I'm saying to you that my God, because of, because of you giving, because you were that one church that made sure that all my needs were met and all this different stuff, and you continue to give. You didn't just send one time and say, well, Paul, we sent you already. You should be happy. He said, no, but you sent aid once again. Now, I'm telling you something. The God that I serve, now he shall, he will supply all of your need. And he said, not just what's according to the earth, but according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It's what he declared. And that's what he said. Guys, we have a heavenly account. The question is, how fat is your account? Is, is it an overdraft? Because you're so busy praying and, Lord, I need this. I need, you, you know, you, you're making withdrawals. You're trying to make withdrawals with your prayers. Lord, please. Lord, don't you see? Don't you care about me? And he's like, I, son, I care about you. I, daughter, I care about you, but I've, I've, I've given you the means to do it. If you seek first the kingdom of God, if, you know, not busy trying to do things your, your, your own way. And, and in, your own, in your own timing, and well, it has to be done this way. No, no, no. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. And that's what's going to get you from that place of depletion to a place of increase. You have in a heavenly account. Let, let me give you this one last verse, and then we'll, we'll stop. In um, Haggai chapter 1, verse 6, I think I gave it to you last week. Um, I know for sure I gave it to second service. But again... Sometimes we have this mentality that there's never enough. We have this wrong mentality when it comes to generosity. We're thinking we never have enough. And so it says this. It says you eat. Well, it says you sow much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put them in a bag with holes and we have this bag mindset this bag mentality which means that I, I just feel like there's never enough I, I just never have enough and so I've been I've been doing this I've been I've been I've been I've been doing this and I've been doing what you told me to do and I just never have enough New Living Translation I want to read from verse um, 3 to verse 8 because this is how most Americans live most Americans live this way can't get ahead always struggling, saying things, well, I wish I could give more, but I can't afford to. You know, I got student loan payments. I got this payment. I got this payment to do. You know, I, I would love to tithe, but I don't have enough in the bag. It's that bag mindset. It's that fear of loss. It's that, it's that um, I, Lord, you know I trust you, but I just happen to trust more the natural stuff than I do you. On our dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. But, Lord, you know, really, I just, I know, I know that's there to remind us, but I just don't quite trust you. And it's not about you. It's not you. It's, it's me. It's me. Well, we know it's not God. In verse 3, it says, the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, and are but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you are putting them in pockets 
fill with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. If we're constantly living with this pocket mentality, with this bag mentality, with this purse mentality, where I never have enough, you will always limit what God wants to do in your life. Even in Malachi chapter 3, he says, he said, um, when he was dealing with, with, the, um, with the Israelites, he said, you've robbed me. He said, how have you robbed me? He said, in tithes and offering. And he says, you've, you know, he didn't just say that this affected you, but he said the whole nation was affected. Do you realize that churches, when there's like no tithing and, and, and all that, when, when, when people aren't truly honoring God, because it's not a curse issue, it's an honor issue. When they're not honoring God, when they're not putting trust in him, because again, even the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, um, it says, here mortal man receives tithes, but there he received it of whom it is witness that he lives. The money doesn't go up to heaven. I mean, that, that minister or that ministry is who receives that tithe and it's used for the work of God and for the kingdom. But there, your heart, is, it comes up before God as worship, as a more. So while people are receiving, while, while God has ordained that men receive tithes here, it says there he receives it of whom it is witness that he lives. And I know people will say things, well, no, you know, you could just give your money to the poor. Well, I'm giving my money. Under, not only says, here, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat, spiritual food in my house. He says, see if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there won't even be enough room to receive. <sighs> Again, my teaching, my purpose for teaching is, is not about the stuff. And, and you, I, I, as I'm teaching and, and you're hearing these things, it's not even so you can get so excited and so hyped up because, oh, I'm going to get this. If, if you're just giving to get, now it's a principle, but if your sole purpose is giving to get, you're still selfish and you still have not caught the point. Well, you know, it's like if my child comes to me and be like, well, Daddy, if I give this to you, you're going to you're gonna give me this? That doesn't make me feel good. No, but when they're like, Dad, you take this. Here, this is for you. Daddy, you want some of my Skittles? Now, each one is a carb each. No, I don't want that. Put it in my bag. But no. When they're just doing it out of love for me, it does something. It's so impactful. When you're giving first and foremost because, Lord, I love you, and I want to see your kingdom continue to increase and impact, then, and then you start to increase that and stretch that, yes, there's a principle where he will see that. And, and use your faith in that. Don't just give without the harvest in mind. I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm just saying your number one motivation should be, my heart is connected to you, Lord. I love you. I love what's, I see that your kingdom needs to increase in the earth, and I want to be a part of what's, what's happening. Amen. So even with our goals and that, that 140, I, I declare we will far exceed that 140,000. I've been saying for, for years, somebody's going to give us $50,000. I mean, at one time, boom, $50,000. I don't know where it's coming from, but God has been raising some people up. Glory to God. You know, I used to think that it had to come from maybe somebody's going to come in, uh, you know. And, but, and it could happen that way. But, man, I'd much, me personally, I'd much rather raise them up from within. Because if you can give that one-time $50,000 check or however you want to do it, my goodness, imagine what's happening. Imagine There's more than you have than just in your bag. But the bag mindset, the, the pocket mentality, the purse mentality will constantly be at a place where I don't have enough. I can't afford to. I'm already living check to check. Amen. Praise God. Y'all got anything out of it today? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for speaking to our hearts today. We do endeavor to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and we thank you that all these things will be added to us. Thank you for speaking to us. And I believe that some of us receive revelation, even if it was things that we knew already, all familiar to us, that, Lord, there'd be some enlightenment 
some illumination in our hearts and our spirit so that we can truly apply this to our life and see the increase that you've designed and created for us. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in the lives of your people, people getting saved and set free, their loved ones coming to know you, people getting healed. But I thank you also for the financial things that you're doing in their life. We bless you, we honor you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Real quick, if you're in this place and you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life and you love to have that opportunity today, I'm just going to lead you in this prayer. Just pray this prayer with me. Maybe you're watching online and you say, that's me, I hear what you're saying. And I need, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Or maybe you need to rededicate your life to him. You just need to make a decision for Jesus right now. Let me tell you something. There's now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And so you don't have to live a life of condemnation, of guilt and shame. You make Jesus the Lord of your life, and you can be free from that. And you that are saved, if you messed up, the devil will try to bring condemnation to you. Don't allow that to come in. No, just pick yourself up by the grace of God and keep moving forward. If you messed up, ask God to forgive you. And the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And like that, you are back on track with him. Let's pray together. Just say this after me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I know and I believe he died for my sin and my unrighteousness. And I declare that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much for living in me. I choose to live for you all the days of my life, and I'll seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or second time or whatever, uh, we want to know about it. There's going to be some prayer counselors here at the front of the room at the end of the service that we'd love to pray with you. Not just for that, but maybe you have, maybe you were one of those, well, I'm a believer and I just have some prayers that I want to agree, agree with me in prayer. They'll be here for that. And you that are watching, if that was you who prayed that prayer, let us know. Send us a message or something. Call our church office. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you and help you along the way.